everyone. I have someone really special here with us today. Terry Yu is an amazing human being who I met a couple months ago now. She is part of Team Kajabi and one of my favorite brands that we partner with long term. Terry recently joined their team after selling her company, Vibly, to Kajabi, and it is now branded as Kajabi Communities, which if you've been part of our community for a while, you know that our newest membership that we soft launched earlier this year is hosted on Kajabi Communities. It's incredible. It's like a replacement for Facebook groups, replace Zoom with it, Discord, Circle, a lot of the community-oriented type of channels. Kajabi Community is a great solution that can help you house everything in one place. So Terry, I'm super excited to have you on today to talk about your acquisition and what that's like. Welcome. Thank you, Ellen. And I got to say, your voice is so soothing. Oh my gosh, perfect for a podcast. <laughs> well, thank you. And Terry's mic is the cutest for our YouTube watchers. Can you just just like pull up your micro set. Like a little embarrassing, but this is my hack together setup until I get a better one from Kajabi. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a mini mic like clipped onto a blanket and it is the cutest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> okay. So Terry, I give a quick introduction into what Kajabi communities is, but obviously for today's case study, we're really going to be looking more at when it was still your company that you built Vibly and how that acquisition came to be. I think you might actually be one of the first entrepreneurs on here. I mean, we've had a, maybe a couple, a handful of others who have sold their companies, but I'm really interested to kind of get into your brain and understand the process behind this and what motivated you to do it, how others can think about building their companies to be sold eventually. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the case study though, the first question we always ask our guests is what's your cubicle to CEO story? What was that catalyst that launched you into entrepreneurship? And I know for you, your story is a little unique because after you sold it, you're back working on a team, but what's your story there? Yes. The ironic part is I'm actually the opposite of CEO to cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> However, it's been such an amazing and wild ride. Lots of to share there. So I did actually start out in corporate. I worked at a company called Asana. I was an early PM there, worked on the growth product side. And what I saw was that when we were running a lot of A-B tests and just the larger tech industry, there was just so much focus on dwell time, session time, like getting people to come back to the app. And so it was no wonder that a lot of these big tech companies like Facebook, Snapchat, they were creating more of an addictive cycle than they were creating like meaning and fulfillment in life. That was something that didn't sit well with me at the time. I wanted to create something that was meaningful, truly socially fulfilling, like something that brings real value to your life and you're happy with years after, you know, you've had that experience. That was a mission coming out of Asana was I wanted to create something so meaningful that people could become more connected than ever in a really mean, like impactful way. So we started Vibly and it became a way for creators to host intimate communities so think of like a photography community or a wellness community. They could have a place where people accomplish their goals together, learn challenges, do events together, have lives together. And one of my favorite creators that we worked with then was Nihongo Tikita. She had 300K followers at the time on Instagram and she taught Japanese. So their community got with practice Japanese together, like do very cute like Japanese exercises together where they would like speak certain phrases, like give each other feedback, challenge each other. And it was just so exciting to see like people actually progressing in their own lives and their careers and their skill sets because of the platform itself. So that's kind of how we like got to where we were. Ultimately, we ended up joining forces with Kajabi and that is how how I am now working remotely from a cubicle <laughs> of Kajabi. I mean, if you're watching this, instead of listening, if you're watching on YouTube, Terry's cubicle is obviously not really a cubicle, but it's gorgeous. I was actually just complimenting her on the background and her design taste. It's gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Pandy style house. So not a bad cubicle to be in. <laughs> yes. And not a bad team to be on either. I love that your story is representing a different journey than most of the guests that we bring on the show. Because like I said, not a whole lot of guests that we featured have necessarily sold their companies. And I think understanding like what it's like to go back to working on a team after you have been the person in charge for so long will be a really interesting discussion that we can get into as we move through this case oh study. Gosh. 
I could talk about that forever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I definitely want to hear your thoughts on that. Let's first start though with a little bit of context going into this acquisition case study. And I think the first question I really want to get a clear understanding of when you built Vibly originally, did you always build it with the end intention of selling it? Or was that kind of just a natural event that happened as you were growing? So the style company that we built when you're a platform is meant to be a venture backed style company where your ultimate goal is to scale to millions, to billions. You want to IPO. When I started it, I wasn't exactly sure which path I wanted to head towards, but I knew I wanted to make the biggest impact and splash possible. So when we started to build a team, when we started to raise money, and we raised over 2.5 million from people like the co-founders of YouTube, meetup.com, Asana, like Lean Startup, like people like Hit and Shaw, like big names in the industry, like they all want to join a mission that's going to have a huge down in the world. And so I very much wanted to build the company to that level and really magnify our impact. But along the way, of course, like we ran into challenges. I became really like super burnt out at certain points. I mean, I grinded for five years. So I think these kind of events you come across naturally. And so when we received our series A term sheet, that was when I started to think about like we were getting acquisition interest as well from like, I think Patreon had reached out, Google had reached out. And so there was a deliberate action at that point for me to figure out like, what is the risk reward of us continuing given like my energy level, given like the challenges ahead, but also given like the amazing impact that we could have if we partnered with a company that did already have a ton of users and a ton of creators. So it was all part of that decision-making process, but I knew that it was all about impact for me. Yeah, I can definitely see that being a driver from the inception through where it is now, which I can totally see the value, even just as a user myself of the product that you've created. I'm so grateful because it is such a breath of fresh air to be able to connect with people off of social and within our own app, which is what communities has really allowed us to do without having to hire a developer to create something of our own. And I think it is just such a great way to utilize a platform to create real connections both online and offline. I think that's what's really inspiring about the way you've set up your product. Like one of my favorite features, this seems so simple, but I actually love that when people sign in to create their profile for the first time when they're joining our community, they're able to share where they live. They're able to connect their other accounts. They're able to answer these fun questions <laughs> about like, you know, what countries have you traveled to? Or like, what's your favorite thing about XYZ? It's in a way, it kind of feels almost like when you sign up for like a dating app and you're answering, you know, these different <laughs> yeah. questions, but like getting to have a holistic view of who a person is from the moment they join your community, I think is so powerful for connections. We really wanted to make that super intimate. And I'm so glad you're getting a lot of utility for you and your community. We also really want to maintain like that psychological security for creators too, because as you mentioned, like social media is such a blessing to be able to build an audience on, but it's not necessarily the place you want to put your business and livelihood on. That's what Kajabi mission has always been just to power the business and livelihood for entrepreneurs all across the world. And that really resonated with me when we're thinking about which company do we join? How can we help creators and our community members get the most out of something like this? And so it was just like a perfect match at the time. That makes complete sense. The ownership of the community, I think, is that missing aspect for so many people. Like you said, you can build a thriving community on YouTube, on social, on whatnot, but ultimately you don't own that asset and it can really be taken away from you yeah, at any and point. Every month, it feels like there's a new piece of news that may cause like the social platforms to disappear. So TikTok was going to get banned at some point. You know, who knows what's going to happen with Twitter now that Threads is, you know, the new platforms. While it's great engines, it's just not something that you should completely depend on to build a business. A hundred percent. And I will say just from an entrepreneur's perspective, and again, as a user of communities, I think what I really love is in the same way that when you send an email to your email list, unless there's a deliverability issue, you know, you're able to reach 100% of your audience. Of course, whether or not they choose to engage with you to open your email, to respond, whatever it may be is up to them. But in the same way, in my Kajabi Communities app, I know 100% of the members inside that community will be notified, will be able to see my message. And whether or not they choose to engage is, of course, up to them. But 
having that peace of mind and knowing that I have control over the delivery and distribution of whatever I'm creating is just something that really cannot be stated enough. And you referenced just a moment ago, you grinded for five years. So just to clarify, from the moment you had this startup to when you sold it, was that a five-year window or was it actually longer than that? It was approximately five years. I did work on it a little bit as like a side thing at the beginning. And then I dove head first into it. So it could have been a little bit longer, but yeah, five years of PR grind, pounding the pavement. Like I had no life. I axed all my hobbies. I had no time for friends. I didn't prioritize anything of my own wellness and fitness. So it was a lot of grinding and it was worth it in the end, but I don't necessarily recommend that path for everyone. Yeah. No, I appreciate the truth in that. And I think that's why I love interviewing entrepreneurs from diverse industries on this show, because I think oftentimes when you read about the type of acquisitions like that, you know, the world you've played in and we read about richest people on, you know, Forbes billionaire list or whatever these things are, we tend to glamorize that, but we forget that the sacrifice it took for someone to reach that level of business is not necessarily what everyone actually wants to execute on to get to the end result. So true. So true. Like the multi-billionaires, like Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Elon, like we tend to criticize them sometimes of like, how much more they're making than everyone else. And I think there's some truth to that. But at the same time, they have worked their asses off for decades, most of their life. Like they're always on, overloaded with emotions, like drama, emergencies, getting little or bad sleep. There's constant fires and thousands of employees are depending on their every move. Like you can see some of their marriages and relationships are broken, maybe because of their absence and lack of focus on that. And so everyone has to ask themselves, like, is that the life you want to live like mm-hmm. not everyone is cut out for that i clearly could only handle it for five years of that intensity some people take it more in a balanced approach which is probably better in the long term but yeah there's a certain amount of resilience that you have to accept to take this path i do appreciate you sharing your honest experience and what you had to essentially give up in order to achieve something like this because it allows our listeners who may be thinking about going down a similar path to go in with eyes wide open, right? No illusions about what that path could look like. And in getting your company to a place where it was even able to be considered for acquisition by another company, I want to talk about that a little bit because I do think that context matters before we get into the actual details of the acquisition process. So you achieved something remarkable. I mean, you were getting 59% month over month growth. I wanted to clarify, is that in users specifically or revenue that you were achieving that? It was revenue that we're growing month over month. We had a total membership revenue because of our creators were charging a X dollars a month to have access to their paid communities around 2 million that year. And at the run rate that we're growing at, we were going to exceed 6 million that year. So it was like 16 times growth within seven months. And we were definitely hitting an inflection point there. We did have about 175,000 members on the platform, but it wasn't necessarily like a lot of the VCs and companies cared about because it was more about like the growth potential from the revenue side. Interesting. So your business model, did you act in a similar way as Patreon where you were taking a cut of the revenue your creators were making? Exactly. Yeah. So originally on Vibly days, we were rev sharing around anywhere from 10 to 20% with mm-hmm. our creators who would charge access for their paid communities, their memberships, their masterminds. We changed that once we joined Kajabi because Kajabi's mission is to empower the creators and entrepreneurs in a way that, you know, scales with their business. And we did see that as a creator grew with that take rate model, it just didn't seem fair anymore. It equates to taking like 10 to 20% of someone's business at that level of success. And so while RevShare is very friendly for entry-level creators, it's not necessarily good for a longer term for a business. So we wanted to just align with the values that Kajabi had there. Oh, you make such a great point. I didn't think about it that way until you phrased it, but you're so right. It's really appealing for early level creators, like you said, to do rev share because it's no risk to them. Like if they don't sell anything, they're not out of pocket any sort of cost, right? But to your point, if you're an established entrepreneur or creator, at some point, if you're doing ref share, it is like almost giving equity to an external partner because they are taking that cut every single time. I guess I never thought about it that way, but you're so right. And I think that what's broken about the model for so many ref share based companies like 
Etsy and Patreon and whatnot is that model is inflexible. Like as you scale, you get diminishing returns and it almost punishes you for growth, which I'm really glad that it's not be yeah entrepreneur friendly. And uh, you see all these like investment deals being made, whether on Shark Tank or just with your personal investors, people will pay for 10 to 20% of your business. Like millions sometimes rounds are 100 million plus type of deals too for that kind so it's just not worth it to give up that amount of your business when you could be just paying a it's a software at the end of the day that you're using and they're not investing that much money that much time into your personal business so Mm -hmm. you shouldn't be giving that much equity up Yeah, that's such a great point. And I hope if you're listening to this and you play more in the creator world than perhaps the entrepreneur identity that you're paying close attention to what Terry has to say, because what I was meaning to comment is that I'm glad that you switched to just that flat subscription software cost once you join forces with Kajabi. And one more thought I wanted to get your insight on when you were emailing us beforehand, you made a quick note that says something like 3.5x monthly spend versus Patreon. What did you mean by that? So when we were at the peak of before we sold, we were helping creators charge for access to their communities. And what we saw was like when creators are giving valuable insights and like connection within their community, it is actually worth a lot more than like donation based platforms like Patreon. So Patreon, you can gate things behind it, of course, but for the most part, they were like a payment processor at the beginning where they, you know, people would donate as a patron and try to support your business. But what we saw was that creators were making 3.5 times the amount that they were making for their creators. That was something that we were quite proud of. Interesting. Okay. So that's another nugget to consider and how you're monetizing your community, which is a whole other conversation that we could (laughs) spend hours talking about. Let's get into the actual acquisition phase of this. So like you said, you got to a certain point in your business, I'm assuming towards the end of that five-year run where you were growing month over month by 59% in revenue, you were on track to hit $6 million in revenue that year. Did the first offers or people who were interested in buying, did they come calling or did you decide I'm going to put this up for sale in the marketplace, hired a broker, or put an asking price on? Like, How did that all come about? Yeah. I think of everything in life like a funnel. So whether it's reaching new customers or even dating or fundraising, recruiting, all this is just a funnel and you want as much top of funnel volume Mm -hmm. so that your end result becomes as compatible or as like valuable as possible. So when we first got our series A term sheet, that was a trigger for me to really think about like what our business is worth, what our challenges were, what we needed to do to make this even bigger. And because there were other options coming in, which was like some of the acquisitive interest, I fully explored that path and created a spreadsheet, created a list, sent out emails, asked for intros. This industry in general for m and and fundraising is very driven by referrals. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't necessarily like send a cold email to like Snapchat and say like, Hey, we should talk or whatever. It was finding an intro or a referral that could speak highly of us that like knew someone who knew someone. And so with that funnel, we ended up with about five M&A offers. Uh, One was a crypto company for three were major social media companies. And then at the end of the day, we had the most compatible deal, which was Kajabi. So that was how we kind of made the decision. And I'm glad that we had multiple options because that gave us large verge in negotiation. If we didn't have that, then the deal would have been much, much worse. It may not even have happened because there was no urgency created. And so everything I do, you always think about in funnels. That's a really great visual to give. And that makes complete sense. I, of course, have never personally sold a company, but I've watched people in my life do it. And you're right. Having more hands in the pile who want a piece of the pie that you've created definitely creates that environment where you have more leverage just for our listeners and for myself. So M&A mergers and acquisitions, in case you missed that um, acronym, a series, a term sheet. I'm not familiar with the world of venture capital. So tell us real quick, 
why a series A term sheet would trigger a buying opportunity. Yes. So startups have different phases and milestones. It can be as early as a pre-seed. Sometimes there's a second pre-seed. There could be a seed round. There could be a seed two round. Series A is next. Series B, series C, series D, and so forth until the IPO. It's split like that based off of fundraising rounds. So we had a pre-seed round. We raised 500K. We had a seed round that was around 2 million. And then the series A, that was a offer from an investor a venture capital firm to get substantial chunk of equity around 20% in our business for the money that they were infusing in. Mm -hmm. So at that time, your company gets priced mm -hmm. in terms of like, they're looking at other companies in your segment, they're looking at the potential multiple that the company could be worth once you IPO, assuming you IPO, they're looking at the risks that your business has, whether that's like legal risk or talent risk or founder market fit risk, like just assessing all the different types of ways that you could potentially fail, but also, you know, evaluating your successes as well. And then once they put a price on that, you now have a valuation of your company in terms of saying like, this is what your business is worth. Mm -hmm. So with that, I started to think about what is our business worth and what would it be worth if we sold now versus later with the this kind of like priced in understanding of where we would be as mm -hmm. a company. So that is why I started the acquisitive process. A lot of founders don't necessarily do that. Like they will just raise their series A, have a lot of venture capital firms, like give them term sheets, close that then raise a series B, continue forward. But my personal journey and the one we chose for Viably was joining forces ultimately at that stage. I have two questions that come out of this. First is ultimately is the reason you decided to start the inquisitive process at this point solely due to the fact that like what you said earlier, you were really burnt out and thinking, I'm not sure I want to continue scaling this on my own, even with a capital infusion. Or was it actually something else entirely that ultimately made that decision for you? So that's my first question. The second piece is, are you able to share what your company was valued at or give us at least some insight into, I mean, like you shared, your company was about to hit a $6 million annual revenue run rate. So if you're not able to share the actual valuation, perhaps giving some insight into like the multiples, like how do you look at a software company like yours and what's like the general multiple that would be assigned to a business like yours? Yeah. So I chose to sell for two reasons. One was personal. I was very burnt out. As I mentioned, like I had no life for those five years. My husband was sick and tired of it as well because he yeah. has been my like therapist for the last <laughs> five years. And it's such an emotional roller coaster. He really is like the silent co-founder in some ways. And I needed some relief and some break at some point. So right. my decision process was like, do I take this term sheet and then hire new leaders to potentially like carry the torch forward. But it's not necessarily the right thing to do from the venture capitalist perspective, take it and then hire someone else and kind of like sit back, right? They would want you to continue to gruel, to work like for it. Like they're putting the money in many situations, like on the founder. Mm -hmm. And so if the founder isn't able to be at a hundred percent, like it's not good for the VC firm. So considering I like valued the relationship and I knew where my energy level was at, plus like, you know, my relationship uh, at home was like, I knew that there wasn't something that I could continue to go at 100 with. But the second reason was also just the challenges that I was honest in assessing with the business. Like as much as we were growing, it required me to still push the boulder uphill. Like, I think we'll talk about this in the case study aspect of this, but we did do a lot of like outreach. We personally talked to creators, personally was in their inbox, personally sold them. And it wasn't like it was just this like lift off that when you hit total product market fit, everything just like naturally rolls downhill and you can't even stop it if you tried. It was not that feeling yet. Mm -hmm. It's not to say we couldn't have gotten there, but we had tried almost everything we could and we had also turned over every rock to the point where I was trying to figure out what is a valuation we could get now versus valuation we could get later. What is the right thing to do for our team, for myself, for our investors, for our stakeholders? And at the end of the day, partnering with a company like Kajabi that has over 100K businesses, they power over 5 billion in creator revenue. Like creators are making on average 5 million a day on the platform. And so they have product market fit. And so did we want to partner with a company that 
that like actually has that and has a deep need for the platform that we've built so we can have impact on 75 million plus students across the world? Or do we continue to operate independently and then continue to push forward, hoping that the risks that we take on is worth the wait? Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the right answer. There could have been a world where we continued and we like overtook Kajabi even, but I think I took the best calculated risk and decision that I could with the information had. Thank you for walking us through your thought process. I love getting to peek inside your brain because you're such a smart person. And I really admire that you recognize the potential of something, but also at the same time, you're able to have the wisdom to prioritize perhaps what's more important to you in the grand view of life itself, not just, you know, what is the, <laughs> what is the capital opportunity? here. And I think that's really admirable. To the second piece of my question is the valuation of your business, something you are able to publicly disclose. We can't disclose the terms of the deal legally, but what I can say is that Kajabi is a $2 billion company. They have raised $550 million from top VCs, including Target Global. They did need to beat the four of the offers that we got. And it was a very life-changing experience for our team, myself. The timing was a little tricky, and but I'm going to be honest, like it was on the cusp of the 2022 market jitters and there was a little bit of like downturn happening at that point. So we did feel some pressure from our end to pull the trigger on one of our deals, but it was such a gratifying experience, even outside of the financial like success of it. It's more the networking and the connections that I built are above and beyond what I could have even imagined. We have you know, created something that people are actually using and like my customers are using. And I think I would have regretted this forever if I didn't start the business and didn't try to give myself a chance as an entrepreneur. A hundred percent. You mentioned that 75 million students are served essentially by the creators on Kajabi who produce $5 million a day in generated income from the platform. So that adoption of placing your product in front of those students, did you find that to be an easy transition or were there some challenges there that you weren't anticipating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so curious to hear your perspective because you've been using it. When we launched, it was January of this year. And so we were just overwhelmed by the response. Like people really needed communities within Kajabi mm -hmm. and there was so much love and positivity. There was also so much area for improvement where people were giving us feedback about needing this and that. And our backlog was no joke. Like there was a lot of stuff in there and we had a lot of ranked things in terms of requests. So I think the challenge was figuring out for Kajabi heroes specifically, we call them heroes, as you know, because yeah. they're entrepreneurs that are powering the next era of business, but they needed specific things that were very tailored to Kajabi. Mm -hmm. So like Kajabi itself is really powerful because it's customizable and that was an element that we hadn't necessarily embedded uh, natively into the community platform, but something we started to build really rapidly on top of our existing engagement that we were seeing in the communities, like what we had already proven out could work really well for communities and add that customization layer. Mm -hmm. So now we're pretty much there. We still have more to do, as you know, like we're building things like more custom look and feels of the community. Although we also have the branded like community and course experience in the future to look forward to too. But we also just release like custom emails that you can send out. Just things like that are very much things that we're heading towards and it'll become even more powerful as it integrates directly into like courses and your email newsletter and your landing pages. And you can add like automations and segmentation and all that. So we're really excited for what's to come. Yeah. And as a user myself, I'm really appreciative of just how receptive and open you are to feedback and really taking action on that feedback, which is huge. I want to direct our attention back to the negotiations piece real quick. You said you felt some pressure at the end of 2022 with the uncertainty of the market to pull the trigger essentially on one of the offers that you were considering. What was that negotiation process like? And thinking about this from the perspective of someone listening to our show today who might find themselves at a negotiation table someday deciding to sell their company, whether it's on the scale that you were at or a much smaller scale or bigger scale, what are some of the things that you learned from that negotiation process that you either wish you could have done differently or that you found were real winning strategies that you want to make sure our listeners know about? So acquisitions are decided based off of three major inputs. So the first is team, 
like how talented is your team? How much are those leaders or those contributors at the company going to like change the trajectory of the acquirer? The second is product. So how much can this product accelerate the growth or expansion stream of the company? The third is traction. This holds the most weight in every deal, but it's like how much revenue, how much users you have as a company. It's one of the reasons why the WhatsApp acquisition was $19 billion. It posed a real competitive threat to Instagram and Meta. There were millions of users, maybe a billion. I need to look at the actual numbers, but <laughs> there was a lot of traction, right? And so the more of those inputs that you hit in acquisition, the higher the deal you get. So for Vibly, it was team and it was product. It was not traction mm. because although we were breaking out at that point, like it was just so little compared to what Kajabi already has, right? Like you've heard some of the numbers, like it, Kajabi is one of the leaders in the creator economy at this point. So for anyone who's listening and wanting to get acquired, I would consider those inputs and in preparing yourself for the deal. So like if you need to bring in better talent so that you can make yourself look better, like, you know, prepare. If you want to build a viable product to so have, think about like what the market needs and who could be your acquirer and like kind of tailor your product experience to that. You could do that as well, or you could hold off on a deal until your attraction becomes explosive and is compounding because every acquirer would love to see those like signals before they buy. But in general, I'd say like, don't think about trying to exit as your starting goal. Like you can think about it in terms of a possibility, but the best deals happen when you're not trying to get acquired. You're just trying to build the biggest business you can. And then the opportunity arises that you could get acquired because no acquirer, no venture capitalist, no investor wants to hear like, you're just trying to build to get acquired. That's just like, if you're shooting for just the sky, you're going to land somewhere beneath. And so you want to shoot for the moon and like, maybe you'll land on the clouds or something. Yeah, that's a great piece of insight that I'm kind of curious, like if you are looking at traction, right? If we're looking at that particular piece, when you talk about traction and that momentum and that growth from a company who's acquiring you, do you think they care more about explosive revenue growth or maintaining healthy profit? Because if you look at some of like the biggest case studies in the world, right? Like Uber or even Amazon, right? They were not profitable for so long because they reinvested everything back into aggressive growth, but at what cost, right? So I think in having gone through this process yourself, if you could go back and make your traction piece more attractive to your buyers, would you have more focused on that aggressive revenue and user growth? Or would you have still been more conservative on that in to maintain healthy profit? So there's two types of companies, I think, kind that I built was more the venture style company where there's like these large rounds put into it, you're expected to IPO. There's also a second type of company that is more like you self start and there's less pressure. And it's, I assume it's something that the guests that you have on your podcast generally have. It is what we call lifestyle company on the, on the venture style. It's like meant to be revenue generating. It is often profitable. The traction also often looks good, but it's not necessarily grow at all costs, like scale fast and quick, but scale to the point where you become the next Uber and Amazon. So the acquisitions for each probably look very different. Like I can only speak to the acquisition types of the first. I'm guessing like for the more lifestyle kind of acquisitions, traction probably does matter more in like the acquirer's minds. Like let's say there's a bagel shop, like thinking about potentially acquiring like cream cheese company. Yeah. They would think about like how much more can I sell or how much revenue will I get? How much profit will I get if we were to acquire the cream cheese company or store? They don't think about as much as like, oh, is the person that created the cream cheese like going to be game changing for our store and like have all these like ideas and new frameworks and paradigms that are going to change the trajectory of it. It's like a different type of 
model. And so I think talent or team and product or just team, I guess, matters less. Product still matters a lot. Like I'm sure the cream cheese in this case would matter quite a bit. Yeah. I think anyone thinking about how to sell in the ladder, like the lifestyle like stage, I think would want to focus more on like revenue, would want to focus more on product and probably less on team. Like you don't need to hire like the VP of Instagram's like engineering team in order to make yourself look more attractive. Totally. Yeah. I get that. And I, and appreciate the discernment and how you might approach it depending on what type of business you have. I guess in relation to your case study and your specific instance, were you prioritizing growth at all costs over maintaining a healthy profit margin or in the lead up to the acquisition, were you still trying to keep healthy profit, even if it might stunt growth? So the mantra for the first kind of like the venture back company is to grow at all costs. Just a peek behind how VCs think out of the 10 investments that they make, two of them will get acquired. One of them will become the next IPO big business like Uber, Airbnb, and then the rest will fail. It's a very hits driven business for them where they just want that one unicorn to make it up for all the others. So the pressure they put on us founders is to grow at all costs, is to scale at all costs. Like Kajabi is so different because it was started out as a lifestyle company and then it took on venture capital. And so it had the opportunity to like turn away investors that would have put that kind of pressure. But as a result, it's like we're now nearly profitable, right? So it's a good model to like not necessarily have that pressure sometimes. But for some, obviously, like Amazon, it worked out really well, like not having to think about profitability, like continuing to just take on more money, take on more equity, like distribution, like their model. And, it, you know, they're one of the biggest companies as a result. Right. No, that makes a lot of sense. And all of these models, by the way, that you're sharing, like the traction product team piece, I really like the way you explain it because it's so simple for anyone to understand. And it really kind of forces all of us, myself and anyone listening to evaluate those elements in our business and think, how strong are we in each of these areas and which one do we care about really investing our resources in optimizing, right? To wrap up your case study, Terry, pivoting more toward your own role in the acquisition and then beyond, did you intentionally negotiate your continuation with Kajabi as part of the deal? I mean, currently you're serving the role of director of product. Was your salary negotiation or contract part of that deal? And why did you choose to go that route versus say just exiting the company and either taking a break completely or starting a new business? Yeah. So it was part of the deal because Kajabi acquired us for both team and product. I negotiated our salary, our equity deals, like our compensation, even the like cash versus equity split. I think the reason why I'm still here is not because I have to, like it does make sense for me financially, but it's more that I really enjoy what I do at Kajabi. Like it has such an amazing culture. We're very mission driven to help the next era of entrepreneurs. Like I feel very empowered. There's a lot of collaboration. Every touch point I have with like my colleagues is very positive and my team is still with us. We're still working very closely together. So it's something that I choose to at the moment in time, but that's not to say like there's not an opportunity cost. I'm always thinking about like, you know, what makes sense for me short-term, long-term. I think that's something that I'll like continue to think about. And there's many times where I have felt an inch, but I've just channeled it into different ways, like to help Kajabi or, you know, I started writing a book. Like there's different ways for you to do it that aren't necessarily your own venture per se, but I'm very happy with the situation right now. I love hearing that. And I can attest to what a wonderful group of humans team Kajabi really is. I Love working with everyone at your company. I'm curious, at the beginning, you did mention there are, of course, some hardships in, in transitioning from being the leader, the CEO, to stepping back into a team role. What would you say to someone who may be considering doing the same? So I was surprised post-exit how different you'd expect to feel after. Everyone thinks, all right, if I just get to this point, let's. I just want to sell. I will be so happy. I can retire. I will just be on a yacht, like <laughs> just partying. Like, it'll be fun. I think it's actually, you lose your identity and you start to feel like lost in what the meaning of life is. And it's very common actually for founders to feel post-exit depression. So you'll see a lot of these cases, like some exits where it's like multi-billion dollars, like the founders are like 
suddenly stifled, suddenly have like no feeling of meaning or ownership, their fulfillment like drops. It's hard to feel sorry for these people I know because it's like, well, you know, you've accomplished something and that a lot of people would want. But at the same time, I guess my advice to people is like appreciate the journey and appreciate every step of building and the joy that comes with it. Because as humans are programmed, we're never permanently happy. It's just part of our biology to always want more, to always grow, to always like try to survive with and get more. That's why if you buy something, you're happy for like a day, maybe a week, and then it goes away and you want something else. It's the same thing. So even when you reach that milestone of exit, you'll be happy maybe for a day, maybe for a week, hopefully for months, but it doesn't always last. And so just appreciate the journey. Cause that's what life's about. Oh, what a wonderful and encouraging note to wrap up on. Thank you so, so much, Terry, for sharing your journey with us and giving us a peek into the process of what that looks like to get acquired by a company and make that transition from CEO. Like you said, not quite back to cubicle <laughs> maybe, but like to being a team member, I really, really appreciate you. Where can our listeners further connect with you after this interview? So my Instagram is very professional. I've had multiple publicists tell me to change the handle. It's my favorite. <laughs> questions can message me on a teriyaki chicken. I refuse to change it. So I hope everyone out there can validate my choice to continue having this handle <laughs> and follow me there. <laughs> it is honestly the best. Thank you so much, Terry. Thank you so much, Ellen. It was so much fun.